So I'd been asked a few times to do a video, video on repairing vintage toy motors when they don't run. And of course, a couple of problems in, in trying to do a video like that is that all the motors, I mean, they're not the same. There have been so many different types of motors and so many different types of toys. How could you possibly describe that in one video? But what I'm going to do is describe how I repaired this King Kong toy sold by Marks and I've picked this toy well one it needed to be repaired but second it's going to be harder than a robot toy normally would be because of the fur and it's also harder to repair because it has a remote control so those are all more things that add into the equation of how, how are you going to diagnose the problem? How are you going to get it going? So when I received the toy, it did not work, obviously. So the first thing I did, you're trying to figure out what's going on, is if your remote still has the original paper that protects the inside of the remote, excuse me, this one did, is so I'll go in there with a small battery pack, say a couple of AAs with a couple of alligator clips attached to it and I'll attach this into the remote as if the batteries were in the pack like that then I'll get my voltmeter and I'll first check right where the two uh, battery connections go and make sure there's power at that point so I get my three volts there, good then I'll go to where the wires that are leaving the unit solder on and put my voltmeter across those two pins and push the buttons and if you were looking on your voltmeter one way you should get plus three volts and you push the other button if it's a two button remote you should get minus three volts it should be able to reverse the polarity if that's not working then you have to take your remote switch apart at that point clean, straighten, do whatever you got to do to the contacts to get that going. So once you know you have your battery remote working on a wired remote toy, the next problem is usually going to be in the wire itself, especially if it's an old toy, 50, 60 years old. This particular one, this wire is still pliable. I can still bend it. Most of the vintage toys, especially from the 1950s, now that we're at 2021 now, have gone very stiff and if you actually try to bend the wire you're more likely break the wire but in some cases if the wire is still working even though it's stiff it's preferable to leave it with the toy because you want to leave the toy as original as possible in this case the wire is still pliable so I'm pretty sure that the power was at least reaching the toy now the next problem with a toy like this versus just say a robot especially a vintage robot where you just have a metal body with some tin tabs that you're going to bend that's not so bad to get into I mean it's still bad because every time you bend one of those tabs you risk the fact that the tabs probably going to uh, break off and you're not going to be able to put the toy back together again but when you're dealing with a cosmetic toy in this case a gorilla you're going to have to get in there to fix it, which means you're going to have to remove the fur, at least partially. And you want to do that without damaging the fur. And back when they made these toys, they attached the fur using a rubber cement. Uh, the closest thing we have to it these days would be contact cement, like you'd use to hold countertop stuff down. And they'd just have a big pot of it there with a paintbrush, and they'd slap the paint on the back of the fur where they need to seam down and put it and because it's so fast setting they could move on with their, with their procedures so almost always in these figure type toys the mechanism is going to actually the internal mechanics will be attached to the back and the very front of the body of the toy is what would be removed uh, to, to see what's going on in there so you're going to have to uh, remove things like in this case the metal bands around one of the arms, the metal bands around the neck, they all hide joints. Get those out of the way, find a seam, and start carefully working the cloth loose 
it's very old you don't want to ruin it anymore and it takes quite a while in this particular case the body thing is seamed down the middle and this is this black thing that looks like a chest part that's insert that's actually a part of the tin shell that's under there it's just painted black so you have to peel back in the case of this toy the fur on both sides down the front around the neck and once you've done that <clears throat> there won't be more glue and you can just kind of work it out of the way and get to the metal tabs and just like if it was then a robot toy there will be tabs along the sides and up around the seams you have to straighten and bend those carefully then you can remove the whole thing now let's go over here and take a look at a few I took a few still shots while I was working on this guy so here you can see I've gotten the metal off the front and the fur is being held back I didn't want to take it off any more than necessary I want to keep everything looking as clean as possible so what you're seeing in here is here's the motor in question this big brown thing that's the the sounding box for the for when the gorilla is growling um, and then the good thing you can see in this picture is that little hole in the motor and here is a the same type of motor in a vintage pair of guts that I have there's a little opening there and because there's an opening there and a lot of toys if you can get to that point you can simply go in and spray with some good contact cleaner and lubricant like this Cramelon B5 is one of the best if you can't get that then they're Radio Shack, this is a really old can, obviously used to sell a tuner cleaner and lubricant. When you buy any of these sorts of uh, contact cleaners, you just want to make sure they're plastic safe. This one is plastic safe. This one is plastic safe. Some of them have a solvent, which is good for dissolving the grease, which is hardened inside these, uh, these motors. But... If you're working on a toy that has any plastics in it, you could end up destroying the toy because of the solvents. So, always buy a good contact cleaner that's plastic safe, and they'll normally state that on the can. And what else we want to say at this point? Let's go into some more pictures here. I think I need to go up this way. Okay, here's another shot. Oh, this is where I ended up having to go. Where we just were, I was saying where you could spray it into the motor at that point. Well, my whole point was once you've sprayed it in on the brushes, you can then put your batteries in your remote, push the button, and start rotating some of the gears on the motor, and it should take off and start running. And, in fact, this toy did take off and start running at that point. But I noticed it wasn't running right. You know, sometimes it would be running fast and slow, then actually not at all till I bumped the gear a little bit. It was almost acting like there was a broken broken wire. And unfortunately the wires ran down the backside to the motor. So then the only way I was going to find out if I was dealing with a broken wire or some other problem since it still wasn't running right. I mean I could have put together, it could have fooled a lesser man, but uh, I've seen enough of these to know that something wasn't right. So that meant I was going to have to fish around to the back tabs that held this whole contraption into the back metal frame part and uh, I could get to those without removing all of the fur on the back panel I could leave the fur attached to the back panel straighten them and then lift this whole mechanism away and let's see this is getting right into the motor basically when I got in there and I'll show you some more pictures these aren't in the right order unfortunately when I got in there, what I found the real problem was is there normally is a fiber board right here mounted to this motor that has two brushes that go in to hit the commentator. And where the brush is attached to that very small fiber board, it's just cardboard, um, they'd broken loose. And the only thing that was really holding the brushes in there to where they would work at all was the fact that the two wires that came down to it were very stiff and uh, not pliable anymore. In fact, here is a close-up of the uh, cardboard piece, and this brush was the, the worst of the two. Normally it would be fitting in that little slot right there. This one's still sitting in its slot. But the little piece of cardboard that it crimps around had uh, given up the ghost. This is a side shot of that square opening. If you're lucky, normally you can just spray some contact cleaner in there, revolve a gear a few times, maybe spray it twice 
you'll get everything cleaned up and running right again and while you have the motor where you can get to it you should put a drop of oil on the bearings on both ends here's a picture of it from from this side the brush still sitting in place or is this after I've replaced it I think this picture was taken after I replaced it so anyway there was no real way to to fix that little broken out piece of fiber. I mean, if I'd had no other options in the world, I probably would have went in with some glues, epoxies, or super glues, or something, and, and tried to secure that brush in place with a new wire already soldered to it, and said, hey, that's the best I can do. But it wasn't the best I could do because I dug through my junk pile out in the shop, and this was uh, the guts of a bump and go toy that I actually had when I was a kid. Yep, it's survived with me all these years out in my junk box. And it was finally its turn to give up because it's ex exactly the same model motor as that one. Even the shaft length was the same. And it had the same brush. A lot of the brush tabs on these motors will just have this outside tab here and here. This particular style, it's a very small motor, as you can see by the size of my thumb there, also has these two internal ones. So it's a very, in it's not common. But I just happened to have one, and the brushes were still in excellent shape, so I removed them from my old junk one, which is why I keep the parts in my junk room, and replaced them on the motor, so the motor would have a new set of brushes. Um, this is looking from the backside. The motor fits in here and here when it's assembled. This is that brown box that we saw from the front, the sounding board for making the gorilla sound. There's a cam right here that when things are running, that open and close the mouth. But that cam also pushes on this lever, which will go down and move the, the scrubber, the wiper, the screecher, whatever you'd like to call it. There's a metal finger that comes off that sounding cardboard box and rubs against the gear. So when the mouth is closed, this metal finger on the cam pushes that away from the gear so it can't make a sound and then when the mouth is open that lifts out of the way so that the little wiper arm the screecher arm does hit a gear to make a make a noise this is the screecher arm it goes all the way up and it's glued this is the front of the box when we were looking at it earlier it's glued to the front of the box it's crimped and glued by the factory and it comes down and simply rubs on the teeth of a gear like I say, there's that uh, metal arm that when the mouth is closed, pushes this in such a way, actually pushes it out this way, away from the gear so that it can't screech. And in fact, that's why a lot of these vintage King Kong toys that make this growling sound no longer growl, is the toy had been stored for many, many years, say with the mouth closed and that wiper being pushed away from the gear with a cardboard up here, through moisture and change and humidity and everything else will warp a little bit and so this finger naturally does not push against that gear even when that wiper moves out of the way even when the mouth is open and it should be growling this no longer has the tension that it originally did to rub against the teeth of the gear and so the toy doesn't growl so the way you compensate for that is when you're putting everything back together you have to add a little bit more bend back to this uh, wiper, which goes all the way from here up to here, so that it does want to push against the, the gear. <clears throat> here is the motor now slid back in place. We're still looking at the back. The back would fit on here. The motor slid back in. We have the new brushes in place. This piece of metal is what holds the motor in place in this toy. It's kind of nice. Most of the toys, the motor actually is not held in with a separate piece of metal like that where you can just bend two tabs and pull the motor out. In fact, that's almost never happens. This is a very unusual design. Normally the motor is built into the frame and the only way to get it out is you have to try to disassemble the frame. And because your frame also contains all these gears and shafts which have all been crimped on the end, it can get pretty, uh, pretty difficult to do and sometimes downright impossible. This particular case we lucked out. I mean, I would have been able to re replace the brushes regardless because they were visible. But it made it easier to take the pictures and show you everything. This picture is kind of out of focus, but what it's showing is here is the motor sitting in here. And it drives this large gear here. And on the back side of this large gear, there's a small brass gear 
sort of like the one that's on this motor shaft right here and when this motor is running in one direction it kicks it up so it drives this gear ratio and when the motor runs the other direction it kicks this whole thing down so that it drives this gear ratio this big hunk of blue metal coming off here is simply a counterweight so that you know to offset the wet weight of this gear so that the spinning motor shaft will tend to throw this one direction to the other here's a little bit cleaner shot of it from a different angle here's the counterweight this is the shaft off the motor that mo little gear is the pinion gear on the motor it drives this gear and like I say on the inside where you can't see it there's another little gear like that which when it's down makes it drive this lower gear and when it's up it drives this upper gear so that means when it's down it, the gorilla walks and when it's up it uh, doesn't walk but it uh, makes the growling sound and open and closes its mouth this cam there's one on both sides rotates around and this is what moves the uh, chest arms so it looks like a, the, the gorilla's uh, pounding on his chest and this is basically the picture where we started where you can see that under normal conditions usually a squirt of contact cleaner in here once you've gotten into the toy rotate the gear a few times and run it that's going to clean the brushes and the commentator enough to where everything will start working again what happens is in these toys is when they get really old uh, the grease that's on the commentator has uh, turned hard and so the brushes can't make a contact till you can clean some of that off and rotate them a few times now you don't want to clean all of the grease out of the commentator of these toys here you can actually see inside this one to some extent uh, it's maybe too dark to see inside but um, if you leave that commentator not lubricated in any way the life expectancy of the motor is very short I mean it's in the minutes range before it the brushes would wear through there has to be some sort of a lubricant on there and that's why the uh, contact cleaners that I use are also lubricants bes besides just being cleaners they both say the same thing preserves and lubricate if you don't happen to have something like that then in some cases on some toys I've gone in with uh, it's called black molly grease it's a, a graphite impregnated grease and you can put just a slight amount of that on the commentator you don't need much you just want a little bit of lubricant so that your brushes aren't just rubbing metal on metal the, the metal brush rubbing right on the metal commentator with no lubricant at all it just files right through that little teeny metal brush which is very small so like I say, the hardest part in f in repairing a toy that isn't going to run is going to be getting into the toy without damaging anything and getting back out so that it looks the way it originally was designed. And then you deal with whatever's actually wrong with the motor. So now in the case of this toy, I'm going to try and get this thing shot up, uh, set up so we can maybe get a shot of this thing working. Am I close? It's hard to see in the viewfinder. Okay, so this runs on two D cells. And you're going to have, get this out of the way, you have one button that's going to be the, the walking mode. You can see he's walking right along. And then the other button should be the that's basically the functions of the Marks King Kong Gorilla toy and some basic information that may or may not help you on repairing the motor inside your toy when they're not working.